Hi, this is Moni and today I'll be showing you a new experiment that I did with BTE. Um, so this time I skipped the entire writing part including um, essay and some written text as well as the reading. Except for the filling the blanks, reading and writing. So let's check out the result. So despite skipping the entire writing part, I still managed to get 72 for writing. Um, it's all because of the high score in listening as well as the perfect reading fill in the blanks. Obviously from this experiment you can tell that listening is the key to achieve high score in writing. So it means that you need to work on some nice spoken text. Um, fill in the blanks and write from dictation. I can't stress this enough but always check your spelling and your grammar. Of course I'm not trying to say that writing is not important. The only reason why I got such a high score in writing uh, in this experiment is because I did really well in listening but there's no guarantee that you can do the same in the exam so do well in the essays and some my written text. Okay and now I'll be showing you the recording of me doing the listening in mock test A as well as Reading, fill in the blanks. So I'm not going to show you the speaking part because I already uploaded one video before and now we're going to skip the writing part. Well, who makes these decisions? In the international arena, the decisions are made by states. But to borrow George Orwell's phrase, uh, some states are more equal than others. Uh, the ones who are most equal uh, are the ones called G7, the seven rich industrial countries. So they have an overwhelming effect on state decisions. And of G7, the one that's far and away the most equal is, of course, the United States which since the Second World War has had a position of overwhelming international power and no historical precedent to that, and of course has used it to design a world in the interests of powerful sectors within. Alongside the powerful states, there are the institutions that they've designed, the international financial institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, took over from GATT a couple of years ago. Those are institutions of global dominance, global control, which are themselves controlled by the rich countries and primarily by the United States, which once again has an overwhelming influence.
I think we are in the early stages of a change toward much more human freedom in business. And I think this change may be as important for businesses as the change to democracy has been for governments. The reason I think that's happening is because it's now possible for the first time in human history to have the economic benefits of very large organizations, things like economies of scale and knowledge, and at the same time to have the human benefits of small organizations, things like freedom, flexibility, creativity, and motivation. The reason I think that's possible is because information technology has now reduced the cost of communication to such a low level that it's now possible for huge numbers of people, even in very large organizations, to have enough information to make sensible decisions for themselves instead of just following orders from someone above them who supposedly knows more than they do in a management hierarchy.
Why did they do it? Well, that's very interesting. It's uh, Again, it's a source of a lot of debate amongst scholars. Uh, it's thought that people, the Egyptians, started the process of mummification to essentially mimic the natural desiccation processes of the desert sands. Egypt was a very dry country. Organic remains such as textiles, bodies, uh, human skin, uh, all sorts of things are very well preserved. And especially the desert is very hot. In ancient times, in the pre-dynastic period of the fourth millennium BC, people were buried in, in simple pit graves. And so it's thought that the natural desiccating processes of the desert uh, essentially dried the bodies out and preserved them. The Egyptians observed this and sought to imitate that process. Arjun and Jag were part of the Young Achievement Australia program, which was a good place for them to get their company off the ground. They established investors, applied for patents, and registered the all-important company and product names. Yeah, the names are actually kind of interesting. Being part of the Young Achievement program, we need to incorporate a Y and an A into the name somehow. Uh, that's not really an easy thing to do when somebody says you have to put Y and A together. <laughs> and uh, we thought, you know, it's Australian, we need something catchy. One guy had mentioned Yabby. You know, some people like, you know, maybe people want a professional name, you know, they want like, you know, medical devices incorporated or something. But, you know, we thought, no, it's got to be catchy. We've got to have some character to our product and a bit of style and something that people really remember. Medical devices incorporated. So between 4,000 and 3,000 BC, the Mesopotamian Sumerian cultures do not practice any kind of burial. And then about 3,000 in the early dynastic period, these burials start to reappear. And they reappear with a certain amount of conspicuous consumption. And this is the context for the, the royal burials at work. OK, so the royal cemetery um, consists of quite a number of pits. So these are little people. Um, these are the uh, excavation workers who are coming down into the pits. So you get some sense of how really deep and how really difficult it was to construct these chambers. So, what is quantum mechanics? Even though it was discovered by physicists, it's not a physical theory in the same sense as electromagnetism or general relativity. In the usual hierarchy of sciences, with biology at the top, then chemistry, then physics, then maths, quantum mechanics sits at a level between maths and physics that I don't know a good name for. Basically, quantum mechanics is the operating system that other physical theories run on as application software with the exception of general relativity, which hasn't yet been successfully ported to this particular OS. But the way we make choices about, individual choices about when and where we drive, an example is an example of how perfectly reasonable individual choices can turn into a collective disaster. A few years ago, every driver in London took a rational decision based on cost and time and comfort and other factors to climb into a car, drive to work. And that was fine when there were only 3,000 or 30,000 drivers. But when it became 300,000 drivers, people independently making the same perfectly rational decision, we had a result which no individual driver could predict and for which no individual driver could feel responsible and actually which no reasonable driver would want because it held them up. Uh, you know, we all know that the roads actually would be clear if the people who don't need to drive didn't drive and that the people who don't need to drive is anybody but me, generally speaking. But the point is, none of the 300,000 who drove during that period, is some secret anarchist who wanted to clog up the roads.
Well, I would class it as a wonder drug. Um, a, because, you know, if you look at the, uh, the structure of aspirin, the chemical structure, it's really simple. I mean, a lot of drugs these days are very, very complex. Aspirin is one of the simplest drugs around. And it's also one of the oldest. It probably is, in terms of a synthetic drug, it's the oldest. As I said earlier, it was marketed in 1899, so it's well over 100 years old. Uh, but, you know, the more people actually study how it works and what it can do, um, the, the more amazed people get. And, and back in the, the late 90s, even though the drug was 100 years old, there were papers being published every two hours on, on aspirin. Um, and there are something like 30,000 papers on aspirin now. And for a drug that old, uh, that's remarkable. A hundred and forty years later, watching yet another Hollywood remake of King Kong, I was struck by what a poor choice of monster a giant gorilla makes. Gorillas are, for the most part, peaceful vegetarians who live in remote jungle far from humans. The common urban cat, by contrast, is considerably more ferocious. Unlike gorillas, cats are vicious predators and ruthlessly territorial animals that fight and kill regularly. They also have scary claws. Aside from British comedians The Goodies, however, no one has seriously considered making Kit and Kong movies. For once, Hollywood is not to blame for our rationality. Gorillas captivate our imaginations because of their obvious similarity to humans. But the origin of our fascination with gorillas as violent monsters can probably be blamed on Charles Darwin. And in fact, the painting in the, or the image in the lower right-hand corner might look familiar to you, and that's because it would look more familiar if I reversed this line or if you looked at it in a mirror, because that is a line-by-line -line reproduction of Adam in the creation of Adam from the um, vault of the Sistine Chapel, painted a couple of years earlier um, by Michelangelo. And the history of art, of course, is a kind of echo chamber, a hall of mirrors, where Painters are echoing one another, reflecting one another, bouncing off one another. There's, there's no such thing as plagiarism in art. Uh, what is ref if you borrow an image from another painter, art historians call it a quotation. I think that parents are very worried about the potential danger of their children being stalked and groomed and information otherwise being used inappropriately. It doesn't take very much for a young person to quite innocently be putting their photograph up on, a, on a, some social networking space together with a list of their friends and uh, an agenda of what their week looks like and uh, someone meaning them no good at all can have access to... I believe the charter movement, now that it's been 11 or 12 years, really of open schools in California, is starting to enter a separate phase, what, what some of my colleagues call, and I call, phase two. And that has different components. One is, the standards are higher. We, these charter schools have to be better than they ever were. And what I mean is, when I look at the charter schools across the state, and Heather alluded to this, there are some lousy charter schools. There are some average charter schools. And there are some, I submit, great charter schools. And I tend to, and I'm, I'm known for this at the commission, as being from kind of the tough love arm of the charter school movement, where I believe the charter schools that are not succeeding, we deserve to, they deserve to be supported for a while, helped, technical assistance, but they do not have a right to exist. And if they're not serving students, and it may not be just the narrow measures of, of, of STAR and API, it could be a broader measure. If they're not serving students, they do not deserve No, that was, and that's an important aspect. As you alluded to earlier, we've previously done work which has proven that in some situations, even people whose blood pressure is not high can benefit from blood pressure-lowering therapy. So in this study, 
the main reason that we included patients was because of diabetes. We didn't care what their blood pressure was, whether it was high or low. And our objective was to see whether or not lowering average or below average blood pressure in diabetics was beneficial. And the results suggested that irrespective of whether your, your blood pressure was high or low, if you had diabetes, you benefited. Oh, it's very spooky. First of all, probability by itself is spooky. Give me, I'll give you, let me show you how, how probability enters the system. You walk past the store window, mm -hmm. and you see an image of yourself in the store window. You're straight and apart. You're not so bad, you know, for a man of my age. Uh, uh, the guy in the store window who's uh, fooling around with mannequins, he sees you, and you see yourself. What does that mean? A stream of photons from sunlight leaves your face, heads for the store window. Let's consider one of them. It has a choice. It can go right through so that the guy behind the window can see you, or it could be reflected from right. the store window. Right. Some fraction of them are reflected, some of them go through. What, what determines that? Right. What determines right. the future of that photon? And countless such examples teach us that it's random, that it's a throw of the dice. And that's where Einstein made his famous statement, God plays dice with the universe. At every instant of that single object, that quantum object, uh, we have probability. We do not have certainty. The bank is hoping to tap into a fast-growing market. The bad weather conditions led to several cancellations. The main problem is the increase in plagiarism exacerbated by the internet. <laughs> 